Wonderful. It's great to be here. Uh, before we jump into the future is tribal, I want to share a little bit about my own background and give you some of my own cultural biases and how I came to some of these assumptions. Uh, but growing up, I was always surrounded by misfits. Uh, both my parents were anthropologists, and so I spent a lot of time speaking to really different kinds of people. Uh, my father worked with indigenous people in Brazil, and my mother traveled around the world and spoke to people who thought they'd been abducted by aliens. So I don't know how many people believe in aliens. Uh, <laughs> yay, we can talk afterwards. <laughs> um, but growing up, you know, between the ages of seven and 14, this completely terrified me. Uh, I was really scared that I would be abducted. And then uh, getting into my teenage years, I started becoming worried that I wasn't being abducted and feeling like a little bit of pull of egoism. Like if there are aliens out there, uh, why am I not a chosen ambassador of the human race? And so uh, coming from this perspective, it really taught me two things. The value of speaking to people that make us uncomfortable. The value of speaking to people who come from radically different worldviews that really take us out of our echo chambers. And then also the limitations of Western consciousness. There, there's so many experiences that we have that we don't necessarily necessarily have the narratives for. And so part of the effort with neo-tribes is to think about the stories that we haven't really written yet. And so we'll look at some of these emerging narratives and really play with them together. And then I'll bring a few people on stage who have been actively immersed in, in their own neo-tribal reality. Uh, and we'll, we'll make this a little bit more participatory. But coming from this esoteric upbringing, I went uh, really into this corporate heart of darkness. So I went from this uh, really uh, wide open landscape of cultural plurality into companies and into corporations. And within those huge bureaucracies, I felt like I stumbled upon really a lost tribe uh, within these institutions people that were culture hackers, people that were entrepreneurs, people that were really trying to transform their institutions from the inside. Uh, these were people like Dave Burdish, who worked at Ford, who was uh, a card-carrying member of Amnesty International and really tried to get the company to think differently about their practices on human rights who tried to push the company and provoke the company to develop business models beyond just automobile manufacturing, to think about mobility solutions. And so working with people like Dave, we ended up starting this guerrilla movement for these cubicle warriors, for these entrepreneurs, for these people that were really trying to bring completely different business models into corporate contexts. And they faced so much pushback. They faced all these antibodies within this organization. And so it was a little bit like Alcoholics Anonymous, bringing together these people where they could have this shared sense of identity uh, and where they could really share best practices, where they could give each other tips for stealthily how to navigate huge organizations, uh, where they could uh, share instances of being able to pitch and make the business case, and most importantly, where they could find the source of real personal resilience, uh, where they could find that peer support, that entourage that could give them fuel and courage in their work. And then I got bored. I really got impatient working with just people that were trying to transform institutions from within. Uh, this change from within agenda started to melt for me a little bit. And so I started asking, who are the other tribes out there? Who can I spend more time working with? So I got involved really with a lot of social entrepreneurs. I got involved in Occupy. And then I got involved really looking at the fringes, speaking to people in the black markets and informal economies, and trying to understand what can we learn from fringe innovators? What can we learn from gangsters and hackers and pirates and people that we don't read about in Harvard Business Review, but who have incredible stories of creativity and ingenuity? And so my tribal context started to feel a little bit more promiscuous. And I think that's one of the elements of the neo in neo tribes, this fact that we can be part of several overlapping tribes. 
And for me, it was also this feeling that doing the change from within work didn't allow me to really anchor in uh, an activist spirit, in an artist spirit. There were so many things that had to be factored out of me to really think about driving change from within organizations. To be a misfit within a huge bureaucracy, you're constantly camouflaging yourself. Uh, you, you can't be the protester who can stand boldly in your agenda. You have to figure out the politics of an organization to drive change. And so some of my explorations in different kinds of tribes were also my own identity explorations about how could I stand more powerfully in very different ways of being in the world. And so while we have this formal definition of neo-tribes, which is very much looking at this idea of how do we get outside of mass society, uh, you know, that we've evolved to live in much more than just the consumerist reality that we've inherited. So if you like that formal definition, I would keep looking at that slide. I stayed up last night too and I developed a little bit of some poetic indulgence. Um, so let me read you some of the different longings uh, that I have around neo-tribalism. What does neo-tribalism mean? It means we can't afford to live in mass society. It means reality is up for grabs. It means that from the slow, burning discontent of your atomized existence, the green shoots of wildness are springing forth. It means an exit from mechanical rhythms and reconnecting with natural cycles. It means consuming technology with the same conscientiousness we apply to our consumption of food. It means a world where the peak experiences of festival culture find refuge in everyday living. It means radically new ways of organizing business and internet startups around principles of self-organization and cooperative ownership. It means the entrepreneurial cowboy becomes a communitarian angel. It means the tech bro developing aspects of monastic living. It means believing that yes, small is beautiful, but still pondering about transnational political collectives. It may also mean that just maybe we have outgrown mass democracy, that civic culture relocalizes at a scale fit for human agency. I carry in my heart a thousand visions for new ways of being, new ways of operating, new forms of agency. My body craves to be unshackled from an industrial reality that requires my performance. Here and now, let's rewrite the scripts of capitalism. Let's design for each tiny cell of discontent, not with grand schemes and isms, but with gentle prodding into heightened community. Let's sail away from mass society. I want to jump out of my role as consumer, worker, colleague, friend, lover, talking head, leave behind the tattered scripts of identity. I want to rebrand the prison of my discomfort, not as personal failing, but structural undoing. I want to follow the rabbit holes of intuition and unearth a conduct manual for mythic living. I want to feel the flow of the nomad, the pilgrim, the communitarian in my veins without pausing for your Facebook approval. In the lurch of discontent, as we hear the whispers and taunts of the new paradigm, let's examine our fallenness. We're all born into cultures we didn't help to create, cultures that no longer serve. Culture has gone numb. Modern life has ways of fossilizing the art of living. Let's help culture find its pulse. Let's tease out the emergent DNA. Starting now, let's bring into being new tribes, new currents, new cultures, new rituals, new processes, a new embodiment for a new age. So, th thank you. <laughs> So those were really some of the emotional longings that I think a lot of people are bringing into this concept of neo-tribalism. We did a retreat in December in Brazil, and it felt like everyone who was there, while so diverse, had a common desire to jump out of the system. And really, what were they trying to jump out of? Uh, this crisis of meaning, 
the fact that we've lost a lot of ritualistic elements of life, a lot of myth mythic elements of life, our lack of trust in institutions and government, if you see what's happening with the political crisis in Brazil or the US right now, um, we're really questioning this idea of have we reached peak democracy? Can, are democracies even the best way for us to express our citizenship, for us to express our forms of agency? And bureaucracies again. We are living in these command and control systems. So how do we find alternative ways of structuring work, of bringing freelancers together, of developing collaborative forms of entrepreneurship that aren't hijacked uh, by Silicon Valley? And really this piece that there's been such a disconnection between our human existence and natural rhythms. And so those were just some of the things that we feel like we were in crisis with that were bringing us to this moment where we wanted to seek out alternatives, where we wanted to look to different tribes for inspiration in terms of how we can live our own lives and how we can begin to hack modern society. And in addition to these subjective pulls, these drivers, there's a whole macroeconomic landscape emerging that parallels that process, that these two things are really inter interconnected. Um, really looking at this unprecedented inequality that we have, the, the whole externalization of environmental costs, um, also the fact that you know, my own well-being in some ways is tied to the price of oil, is tied to interest rates, um, that my sense of contentment is completely interlinked with macroeconomic factors. And we see this spilling over within the business environment too, where business is becoming uh, thoughtful about how do we exit from these mass corporate structures? How do we think about new ways of organizing ourselves around principles of decentralized governance? And so you have this, these green shoots of a new reality that are coming up around citizen production around what it, would it look like if we disintermediated corporations, if we return to a kind of cottage industry reality that really happened before capitalism started, uh, where we have much more peer-to-peer -peer production. And so we'll hear a little bit more about this. But this trend is also, this whole trend of distrib uh, distributed enterprise, this whole trend of decentralization is spilling over into our spiritual life as well that spiritual and religious realities tend to imitate economic structures. And so we're now in this moment where how do we apply the, the nodes of the internet, the thinking of distributed networks to spirituality? How do we embrace realities around peer-to-peer -peer spirituality where we're not dependent on the guru or we're not dependent on uh, traditional hierarchies within religious organizations? There's a huge movement of growing nuns, so especially prominent among millennials, of people that identify as spiritual but not religious. Uh, and more and more you see these peer-to-peer forms of self-organizing around some of these realities.
So you can see there's some of the provocation with uh, neotribes, but what are we actually talking about? Who are some of these communities that are part of this emerging phenomenon? Uh, one is really gangs. I've spent the last three years interviewing uh, gangsters all over, all over the world. And the gentleman here is King Tone, who was one of the leaders of the Latin Kings. Uh, and he, he really was one of the first people that I spoke to who pushed back against the word gang. He said, don't call us a gang, call us an organization like any other. Um, that we do recruitment, we do retention, um, that even though the majority of their money is drug money, that that actually means that they have skills in terms of understanding how to manage brand, how to do products quality around things. Um, and so he really was at the leadership of this gang at a time when uh, the gang was recovering from one of its most bloodiest periods. And so the questions he was asking are not dissimilar from so many of the questions that people ask who, who are leading other types of communities. He was really saying, how do, what, is the, what is the change management intervention for this gang? How could he uh, pivot the gang to become much more of a social movement, uh, to become much more of an activist organization. And so he started building alliances with really critical allies to bring in some of this new DNA into the organization. Another uh, collective that I spoke with is this great fr uh, French feminist group called La Barbe. And so they'll come to events like this, uh, to any sort of big public conferences, and wherever there's an underrepresentation of women, they basically uh, wear fake beards and crash the events and congratulate the men on how smart and intelligent uh, they are, and, and really uh, provoke audiences into, into being much more sensitive to gender dynamics. And what I love about this group is they operate without a leader. Uh, even in interviewing them, there's no one spokesperson. So they really have this kind of rotating chair for alpha leadership. Uh, and you see a, a lot of this type of activity really within hacker collectives too, within pirate cultures, where you, f you find much more uh, elements of decentralization being built into these organizational structures. <laughs> uh, I think I have to click it here. Whoop. There we go. Uh, another really fun neo-tribe that uh, I encourage you if you're on social media right now to check out are preppers. So you can go to hashtag prepper or you can go to hashtag prepper chat and find this really amazing community of people that come from the radical right and radical left. And they're a little bit crazy. They believe that the apocalypse is coming at the, the end of the world is near. And, and that catapults them into this philosophy of radical self-reliance where they're constantly preparing for the end of the world. Uh, there's even a woman on Twitter who sells foraging uh, advice for like how to look pretty after the end of the world. So she gives foraging tips for people that want to know how to make makeup out of like natural plants and things like this. And so this tribe is actually really interesting in the sense that it's uniting these two different, two different poles of existence. The sort of climate change advocate, uh, you know, who's staunchly uh, <laughs> doomsday in their own in their own right, and then the sort of gun-toting conservative that doesn't believe in big government. And so you have this interesting alliance. We also have eco-villages now around the world, and more and more, I think these were really planted with this 60s legacy of communitarianism. And you know, now you see eco-villages um, almost in every country, and uh, ones that have actually developed a large amount of sustainability. And so a lot of these um, approaches are really built on this idea of the island. Um, how do we isolate and prototype new forms of culture that are fit for an emergent society. And so these groups have tended to, to find ways of totally restructuring sexual norms, of restructuring governing norms, and really incubating them at a small scale until they feel like they're ripe enough for mass infection. And so now you see some of these eco-villages that are seeping a little bit more into the mainstream and looking at this question of how do we scale some of these practices? Uh, how do we scale this culture of embodiment that's been, that's been fostered. <laughs> Another uh, neo-tribe that you wouldn't really think of as a tribe per se is uh, this lo lovely clustering of hermits. Um, around the world you see people that are um, going back to the land and pursuing this solitary form of living. 
And yet they have an e-newsletter that they use to update each other on their little solitary pursuits. Uh, so that's quite fun. Um, and, it's, and there's a long tradition of these kind of, these hermit tribes. You know, Thoreau uh, wrote Walden 45 minutes from where I grew up. And so he had these experiments in radical self-reliance in really rejecting mass consumerism and industrial forms of society. And he did that for 18 months. And then when he went back into society, he had to work at his parents' pencil factory. So I think there's always this question of if you're trying to jump out of the system, if you're trying to peel off from the system, uh, how do you develop a better strategy of cultural infection? Uh, how do you really make sure that you can sort of package your insights um, for, for scale? And I think people have very different approaches uh, around this. And we'll hear a bit more uh, from Derek and Chelsea in just a moment. The other thing that I've been doing a little bit of research on is this idea of utopias and failed utopias especially and looking at what are the dimensions that, that make experimental community thrive. Uh, I was reading this morning, for example, about this great uh, utopia that was set up uh, by the Shakers in Indiana. And so the Shakers had this flourishing community uh, really splintered from the, Quakers group, the Quaker groups, and they had a lot of land. And now there are only three Shakers left, and they all live in Maine. Um, and an element of the Shaker uh, practice is that you're celibate. Um, and so how they've managed to exist for over 200 years was largely through this policy of adoption and also through people that were attracted to the celibate lifestyle, onboarding new members who were adults. Um, and, and now what they're doing is they're actually putting their land in trust because they don't actually have any new members. And across the US, this is happening now, where you had forms of intentional or monastic community that are now looking to the new generation who might not share the same spiritual worldviews, but who could help be stewards of land uh, that would otherwise just be, you know, go to the government or be put up for sale. And so I'm involved in, in some of these conversations looking at how, how can a new gen generation develop intention around land stewardship. And and, and bridge build with some of those generations that had uh, started these communities and some of the practices and rituals. What can, what can the new generation actually learn from some of those elders who have done this work? I'm not going to talk too much about witches, but I've spent some time, especially in the last week, uh, being very Im immersed in different emerging uh, witchcraft cultures. But do you guys want to come up and, and I won't introduce you as witches, uh, but do you want to share a little bit about the experimental communities that you've been involved in? Um, and also maybe any, any practices, any rituals uh, that you guys feel like this audience might want to hear about? Cool. You can sit on the Hello. stools. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I can pick up the, from there, Alexa. Yeah. Firstly, thank you so much for having us in this conversation today, and hello to everybody. My name's Chelsea Robinson, and I'm from a little uh, island called New Zealand, or a set of islands. Um, yeah, so I come from a community in this conversation, a neo-tribe called Inspiral, which I'm sure that some of you who I know here are also feeling connected to. And I've been part of the Inspiral community for several years. And actually this community does have some sort of witchy personalities in it, but it has all sorts of personalities in it that are all cultivating a practice of tribalism in their mm -hmm. own way. Um, when I think about uh, the kind of rituals that we have, we, ha we just have so many, it's hard to know where to begin. And I'm sure that many of them are the same as the practices of your own organizations and uh, different communities that you've spent time with, including uh, bringing your whole self to the workplace through storytelling about who you really are and having a really intensive retreat culture to really build human connections at that deeper level. Um, but I think behind all of this for me, when I think about like the shape of an spiral and the nature of it, it's, it's, a, it's a business collective. It's a community of people creating livelihood together. Um, and I think about, when I think about neotribes, I think about these four L's, which are, which are kind of like, uh, lineage, you know, every tribe has its lineage. Um, love, every tribe, ha tribe has its love practice. Uh, 
livelihood. So most of, from eco-villages to witch culture to gangster kind of communities, there's always this question of like, well, where does the, where does the money come from? Where does the food come from? What, where's the livelihood aspect? And then the last one, leadership. So what is the leadership practice? How do you practice decentralized governance or who is the one leader? And I think these are a really interesting set of lenses to look at things through. Um, yeah. I, I would love to share the lineage of Inspiral, but I wonder if it's the right I think moment. That, I think that's great, just sharing. I think one of the themes that we wanted to explore is around this idea of cultural hybridity. Um, so rather than perceiving tribes as stagnant entities that have no connection to modern realities, what are the different bits of past communities that we're sampling from? And I think the Inspiral story is an incredible illustration of that. Yeah, of course. So this is a very little known story and it's not mine, so also wanting to acknowledge that in these sort of uh, dynamic communities, story is really the vehicle for, for, you know, how did we get here? It's like, what's the creation story? What's the origin myth behind how we got here? Um, so yeah, to also acknowledge it won't be perfect, but in Spiral as a group of devs, basically, developers who sat around in a circle and said, hey look, our income is high enough that we can just work a bit for client work and spend the rest of our time doing work that matters or try and transition our own practice of our internal economy as a collective into an, a collective driven by social and environmental impact. And I think that's uh, that essence uh, and the way that that group sat in a circle and the way that they talked to each other and the way that they gathered came from a community that I've been part of called uh, a circle called Regeneration which was a, you know, it's a gathering like I'm sure many of you have been part of, the sort of community that meets every summer or every winter and goes deep together and shares practice and shares life stories and really sort of asks the hard questions of why are we here and what are we here to do and supports each other with that. And Regeneration was a set of circles and a community and a tribe that came from another tribe in New Zealand specifically called Heart Politics, which is two generations before me. And Heart Politics created the first Green Party in the world. They created all of these um, incredible initiatives, transformed the landscape of New Zealand's industry and politics because of the sort of silent undercurrent work that they were doing in their sort of more personal, more quiet, more mystic space. And then that also has lineage right back to our, um, our indigenous people's practice and culture. So there was a part of the international peace movement was started in a little place called Parihaka in, uh, in the North Island of New Zealand. And Parihaka was a um, nonviolent direct action based indigenous movement against colonization. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of Gandhian practice has actually also been inspired by this group. And their practices are also still the practices that keep Inspiral alive and well. But so many people, so many of the designers, developers, facilitators, accountants, lawyers in this extensive collective that is now Inspiral wouldn't necessarily understand that that's the lineage. But when you do look behind each of these practices, they have these very, very multi-generational DNA, uh, sort of cultural DNA strands. And I think it's just so profound to sort of question that and, and acknowledge it and say, where did this code come from? <laughs> what, how, yeah, how do I find the lead contributor to the other code base? You know? And yeah. Derek, I'm interested in hearing about you. I mean, I know a lot about you, but maybe the audience is interested in hearing about you. But also, if you could speak a bit to this point of what are some of the challenges of uh, remixing culture? You know, within Inspiral, you have these personalities that are, you know, the the business developer person, the programmer person, the Occupy protester person, the witch. So like, how do those cultural personalities interweave and what are some of the tensions or conflicts there? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, hi, I'm Derek. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that to sort of transition from what you were saying over to what you're inviting, uh, in the more recent history of this set of circles is the, I think a really unique combination of people from the uh, freelance, sort of the emerging freelance movement, uh, which is the sort of original and spiral crew, uh, the open source community, uh, and the Occupy movement. And I think the DNA of Inspiral is really infused with these, uh, this sort of deep lineage going all the way back to heart politics. And in combination with this uh, newer piece of DNA, which is the sort of tech DNA, uh, and I think a lot of what we get stuck on uh, as a community is about how we, how we relate our own values and our sense of uh, 
measuring and distributing value to the way that the external world uh, outside of our little bubble uh, measures value. So Inspiral internally has a bit of a market or an economy inside of it. Uh, and the reality is that some people who are programmers bring in 10x of what some other people who uh, might do equally important work, but by the market it seems uh, that they're doing, you know, something that's worth one-tenth. Mm -hmm. So I think this is one of the core stumbling blocks or, or things that we're still working out and that we're talking to actively seeking out other communities who are dealing with these issues as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think through that struggle, often the uh, per peculiarities of different groups' personalities emerges and uh, people's political philosophies come into play and spirituality and se personal sense of value where they get their value from is a really key part. That's, it's great. And I, I want to just share, too, that for us, this is such a new conversation, that Neo Tribes as a frame has only really existed for the last seven, nine months for us to make sense of some of this peer-to-peer -peer sharing between different forms of community. Um, so we're still really trying to find our language for it and would really welcome your input uh, there too. And maybe afterwards, if people want to talk about witches, we can grab beers and do that. Uh, but let's, let's move on because I think one element of Neo Tribes that really distinguishes it from other types of communities uh, is the ephemeral nature, this idea that you can have multiple tribal allegiances. Um, and so I wanted to share a little bit, I think Eleanor was giving a talk earlier, and she was one of the people uh, who really introduced me to this magical world of LARPing, uh, which is a, a particular kind of neo-tribe. Uh, awesome. And so how many people here have ever LARPed before? Yay, amazing. Okay, for those who don't know, uh, LARPing is live action role playing. Um, and you might have this bias in your head or you've seen a film where you associate it with nerds running around in the woods with swords. Um, that's not the case, necessarily. Uh, one of the, the things that I've really been exploring is this idea of using LARP as a way of prototyping alternative realities. And so how can you set up this design fiction, this utopia, this dystopia over the course of a few hours or a weekend to really test some hypotheses that you want to explore. If you want to experiment with the future of finance, for example, why not set up a LARP around it uh, and really get into the embodiment of what it looks like to live in a, a world driven by cryptocurrency or a world driven by um, you know, more distributed financial tools. If you want to experience the collapse, collapse of monogamy and new forms of relationships, set up a pop-up scenario around it and really begin to prototype with some of that culture. The other thing that I've really uh, found in, in LARP that I love is this idea of bleed, which is when uh, the, the personality characteristics of the character that you're playing begin to seep into your own personality. Uh, so I was speaking to someone who taught himself how to be extroverted through LARP. He was a complete introvert and really developed um, you know, social skills through this temporary practice. So I think it's a powerful way for us to be able to access through tribe different types of identity and to figure out how we can hack and challenge ourselves to step into new types of roles. Uh, an experience that felt a little bit like an extended LARP uh, for me, and Derek was also there, this is where we met, and I know there are several folks from, from PAC here at Republica, was this experience of PAC, uh, where we were for five weeks, I was only there for a week, but you guys were there for a good five weeks, in this immersion that was an attempt at rebuilding new forms of society. But do you want to share a little bit about what the, the provocation of PAC was about and how you ended up there, um, and some of the beauties that you found there, some of those gems, but also some of the shadows, some of the tensions in creating this pop-up culture? Yeah, sure. I think, <clears throat> similar to what you were saying, this is, in some ways, this isn't really my story to tell, so I can only give uh, a bit of a, a uh, story from a participant uh, in particular, but yeah. uh, I think the message of PAC was around trying to deliver a message to the COP21 uh, climate conference to say, we're, we're not okay with you just talking about action and not doing anything. We're prototyping on the ground, really trying to figure out what does a society that is sustainable look like? Uh, and there's sort of a underpinning of that uh, 
experiment, I think, that was about open source culture in particular and how, how does that relate to the way that we build societies, manage societies, and come together as communities and makers. Uh, and so for those of you who don't know about POC 21, it was this uh, five week long innovation camp held in a castle outside of this castle, uh, outside of Paris. Uh, and we came together and uh, really prototyped what a new society would look like by building, <laughs> building toilets and creating systems to make sure that uh, everybody got fed. It wasn't a posh and castle. No, it wasn't a posh <laughs> castle. When we say castle, sometimes people think that we were just hanging out, but it turns out the infrastructure of castles is not actually built to hold up to 300 people at one time. Uh, it was, yeah, that was an issue that came up many times. And so I think uh, some of the beautiful things about that experience were that, uh, yeah, just the aspect of transformative learning of being in that context, so I showed up about a week early to help uh, set up the infrastructure for the camp, and it felt like we were in a disaster area. Like, we were figuring out, okay, there's one toilet, we've got like 30 people, we need to build a toilet today so that tomorrow, that, that is not an issue, and also someone's building the showers, but right now the showers aren't working, and uh, there's tents, but some of us are sleeping on the floor, and it felt like, uh, yeah, we were, like a LARP, I guess. We were really prototyping a bit of a dystopian situation, and it was, the beautiful thing was to see over a period of weeks using open source tools and using the, uh, obviously not everything that we used was open source, but uh, really trying to be as generative with the tools of open source and open hardware as we could uh, to create a community with infrastructure. And so by the end of it, uh, I think that there's this uh, kind of magical experience of everybody going through this learning journey and finding out that, okay, some of these things are, we kind of have a handle on. Like we know, we, we can figure out how to build these things and these things meet our need in these ways. And some of these things we, we don't have a handle on. Uh, and so, yeah, I think there was a lot of, there's a lot of difficulty in organizing. There's a lot of difficulty in like being able to see each other under stressful situations. Uh, and I think those are all really human aspects of the prototyping experience. Uh, and yeah, I feel like I learned a lot from it. I know that many of the sponsors who came, uh, who sent people, went off to quit their jobs. <laughs> so I know that other people had transformative I experiences. Think there were two things that really stood out for me um, being at the castle. One was just how everyone's happiness seemed to shoot up when there was good Wi-Fi. Uh, which has implications <laughs> for how we design tribes uh, that are very different from historic tribes. Um, but then also leaving POC, I mean, Manu is here in the front row too of the audience. Everyone seemed to have this deep longing for building a new kind of society and then really struggled to figure out how to bring that back into their everyday life. Um, so Chelsea, I'm wondering if there's anything that you would want to share where you felt like there's been a sort of a longing or a hunger that you found in community or some a particular um, a particular gem that you feel like could be transferable to to sort of mass everyday society yeah I mean uh, I've run a lot of different communities I've been I've been the person who other people call at 2 a.m and they're like I've come up with an idea. And you're like, oh, please go back to bed. Let's talk about it tomorrow. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different, I, every community is so different. Um, it's interesting, you know, there are, I think what comes to mind is about like what currency is gonna sustain that energy and that longing because you, you are always in this process of creating the world. There is no receiving the world, really. You're, you're constantly a participant in creating it and so uh, whether, uh, whether it's like a movement for climate action in policy or whether it's a, you know, an Inspiral style business collective or whether it's a group of people from across an entire sector coming together to pincer movement and change their sector, everyone is showing up with that feeling of like, I can feel it in my heart, how do we do it? And so I think one of the hardest things, and I've, as, you know, as someone in only the early part of my adult life, I definitely have been told many times, it's not about, you know, staying up all night, every night in your 20s trying to do, change the world. It's like, actually, this is a multi-generational process. 
And uh, so I think it's interesting on a small scale, you look at a political campaigning organization and, and a political campaigning movement, something like Occupy or something like Black Lives Matter, and you can see its tribal design um, and its leaderlessness potentially. Uh, and you can see that money's not a big part of that. Maybe it's maybe the donation-based fundraising system is just never going to allow for those people to actually create full livelihood from participating and creating the world in that space. And so the currency becomes love, or it becomes reputation, or it becomes credibility, or it becomes FaceTime, or something. Like, something motivates you to keep showing up to the meeting because it's rewarding for you. Uh, whereas in Inspiral, I think there's this there's a slightly, there's slightly more healthiness, I think, to people being able to earn money together, that that is a gem uh, that I would definitely, that from, from now on I will be designing around, as you know, is like, actually, if we can make money together and then share that shared capacity, it not only sustains us, but it sustains our mission, because then we can take people out of this feeling trapped in this organization where they want to create an internal movement in whatever corporate, as you were talking about, that feeling, and we can say, come into our alternative little economy, we're going to bridge across from the island to the mainland using an economic engine to, to give you more time um, and to give you more sustenance and to allow you to have a holiday. Sometimes too. Uh, so I think there's a really interesting piece about, about livelihood and about money and that, yeah. Um, the other thing about POC, not that I was there, but it just, it's just such a strong reminder that another gem is about time, like how long you know one another. Uh, I think any community over five weeks would encounter the same challenges of, we have to set up a governance system and a whatever, and what is this power structure that's emerging and whatever, and I think that Everything is about time. And when I was talking before about the lineages, you know, circle behind circle behind circle of people sitting together working through their shit is really like, that is, you know, nothing can replace that level of depth that you've created and co-created over, over generations of like the wisdom of that informal uh, knowledge that is coming through that. So um, yeah, there's something there about time too. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to bring our attention to one other element of neo-tribes that we really see in festival culture. Um, there's a, a young guy who, who I met who is part of this peer-to-peer -peer spirituality or philosophy group that we put together called Wisdom Hackers. And he spent um, three months traveling around and going to festivals and really asking the philosophical question, why can't we bring festival spirit into everyday life. And I think from a, from a neo-tribal perspective, there are a lot of ways in which festival culture and community design insights that have come out of festival culture have been really important for even seating groups like Inspiral and, and how we think about even mobilizing politically. Um, but we were also at a festival, uh, an amazing festival in Costa Rica called Envision recently. And uh, we had a bit of a provocation to some of the organizers. And I, I'm wondering if you guys can share a little bit about some of your, some of your discomforts with festival culture and then some of the things that you feel like it's actually incubating new, new forms of DNA or, or new kinds of microeconomies that could be really interesting as a way of transforming mass society. Immediately, I just have a, a sort of a two sides of the same coin, you know, it's, it's the, the same thing that is the gift is the curse in terms of festivals being a place where people can escape and so they can escape in a way that is going to definitely be devoid of their normal life, sense of identity and purpose and daily rhythm. So the escapism of it can, can be a real, it can be a shadow as well as a blessing. But I think in its escape, uh, it also allows for you know, a place separate and free from the bounds of your normal thinking. So there's this, there's this wondrousness of the escape and, and this difficulty with it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I, I guess the, the classic example of the festival that walks this line is uh, Burning Man. Uh, and I think that, yeah, you, it's in, in some ways that's sort of an extreme example, but uh, you've got this peer-to-peer -peer experience to some degree, or at least uh, maybe you don't have it exactly in the same way now as you used to, but you've got this experience of uh, 
going out in a costume and sitting down on a gigantic pirate ship built in the middle of the desert and having a conversation with Larry Page. Uh, and I think that that experience over time has created a really significant cultural shift, at least in California, and I, I think it does ripple out. Uh, so I do think that the, the seeds of experience that happen in those festivals can create real impact. I think that, uh, I don't know, I was really inspired by the Envision founder who we were, we had this panel at Envision talking about post-capitalism, uh, and we didn't, we didn't name the panel. Uh, and I was really inspired by his, his own critique of his own projects where he was saying, yeah, we, we bought this piece of land in Costa Rica and we like invited all our friends and we built this little eco-village and then we realized, shit, we're all just rich white guys uh, and we just bought a piece of Costa Rica from the government and made it ours. Uh, and so now he's like iterated that project and really the next version of what they're doing is more about being a bridge to finance uh, for the local community to co-own that piece of property. And so I, I hope that what the festivals are incubating is something that conscious. Uh, obviously, these things are complex, so you can never really know. Yeah, I mean, it was disheartening at Envision, too, to see people, locals, were sneaking into the festivals, climbing fences and going underground. And, and so I think part of our challenge there was how do you think about festivals as, as sites of inclusion? And how do, you, how do you radicalize festivals so that they're not just about um, hedonistic escapism, which can be really important for one's own personal development, but how do you, uh, how do you bridge that with, uh, with systems? So how do, we, how do we imagine ourselves within a festival context also, um, also being able to think about you know, systemic impacts of that festival? And, and I think this challenge of radicalizing self-help really comes out in this tribalism conversation because you have so many people who are really appropriating uh, a lot of indigenous culture and are going on these ayahuasca retreats and are seeking out personal healing, but they're seeking out personal healing in a way that's atomized from systemic engagement. Uh, so they see that healing as divorced from this post-capitalist moment that we're existing in. Um, I think we only have a few minutes left before questions, so I'll, I'll move us on, um, although the slide wants to stay on festivals. Uh, but really, some of the questions that we, we've started sharing are really, how do we steal? How do we pirate from different kinds of tribes? How do we respect the lineages and remix some of those? And one tribe, <laughs> up. All right, well, I'll just talk about it, and maybe it'll, it'll click over. So one tribe that I've been really interested in is the Amish and um, have spent a lot of time with Amish communities who I think are really incredible for a variety of reasons. I think one, they have this alternative script of entrepreneurship that is much more vested within uh, the community and so within this ethos of collaboration. And you also have within Amish communities this reluctance to technology. So it's not that they're technological technologically abstinent, but they, they believe in slow adoption. So you really have beta testers within the community that are um, first importing new technologies and then seeing, well, what will be the impact of this technology on our community's well-being? And so to bring some of that Amish provocation into mass society, I developed this performance character called the Amish Futurist. And the last time I was at Republica some years ago, she was present. So uh, Rebecca was here and was um, leading everyone in a confession of their technology sins and the vanities that were encouraged by Facebook. Um, but I, I'm, I'm interested too in, in your guys' perspectives because it's been really funny uh, to use Rebecca as a vehicle for actually creating this crack in this uh, culture of entrepreneurship and of the startup scene, for people to be able to share their technophobias, for people to be able to share, well, what are the actual bigger intentions behind this particular technology? So as you guys think about not necessarily becoming more sort of Luddite in your approach to technology, but as you think about, you know, what are some of the social dimensions that accompany technologies that we have to think about, and how are you bringing more of, a, more of an existential awareness to technology. There have been some great talks here on platform cooperatives, for example, that are beginning to think about new forms of ownership that don't go down this traditional growth pathway. Uh, so I think that 
there's, there's tons of different examples of people experimenting in this realm. Uh, so I, for context, I went to school uh, at UC Berkeley, which is in around Silicon Valley, uh, and studied com both computer science and entrepreneurship. And uh, my experience of that was really that uh, the story of what technology is and its role that it plays in the economy is really dominating in a, in a certain direction. So it's like, uh, as an entrepreneurship student, literally, they're like, cool, welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. At the end of this class, you're going to pitch to venture capitalists. So the, it's, I guess, uh, part of my inquiry around intentional technology is really about uh, we as humans tend to, seem to tend to play with defaults or play with stories really easily. It's like, cool, well, I'm, I'm supposed to pitch to this venture capitalist, so obviously this makes sense and he's going to take 5% equity and in two years they'll kick me out of the company. Uh, I think that these, I mean, that's extreme, but like, it's not unheard of and I think that uh, the intentional technology story is one of both being intentional about what the technology is. I think that's something that uh, is really, really present here and, you know. Can you share specifically too, just CoBudget and Lumio sure, and some yeah. of the tools that you guys? So in Inspiral, we've got this like pattern of trying to take uh, social processes and transform them into digital processes for collaboration. Uh, so the, the first one uh, that we kind of, that kind of is the most popular one is uh, Lumio, which is an online tool for collaborative decision making, which came out of a crew from the uh, Occupy movement. Uh, and Spiral very much didn't make Lumio, but gave Lumio a desk and an internet connection and uh, allowed them to sort of figure it out uh, or help them figure it out. Uh, and another, so, so Lumio is sort of the digital version of a social process uh, that comes from a lineage of consensus building practice. Uh, if you get a chance to check out the tool, it's very, very simple. It's like a discussion thread with uh, thumbs and uh, a sort of there's it's this extremely deep practice of consensus building that it comes from uh, and I guess the second tool that you mentioned is CoBudget which is our sort of internal economy tool within Inspiral which uh, allows us to run a bit of a participatory budgeting process which comes from I think originally it comes from uh, housing cooperatives who would put on these sort of project fairs uh, where you would you would sort of show up to dinner one night and everybody would get a couple Monopoly dollars and people would put up sort of science fair style posters and say like, I want to do this with the house's extra money. And if you, everyone put these fake dollars into each other's buckets and then you get, a, you get an allocation of funds based on how much uh, you were given from the community. And so we've, we've been experimenting with these practices as ways of building technology that uh, supports social process and social development and uh, also experimenting within these technologies with different financing structures that allow uh, a bit of flexibility from the, the dominant uh, narrative of, the econo dominant economic narrative of technology and venture capital. And I can go specifically into that with people afterwards <laughs> to talk about the financial instruments. But what's really interesting at a higher level also is that uh, Inspiral has in some ways pioneered this foray into really building open source social enterprises for uh, neo-tribal technology. And I think that it's, uh, it's bizarre how hard it is to find that. Um, so I think that it's really interesting that most technology, and especially the way that it's financed and the way that uh, dominant paradigms of ownership are working in the technology space, uh, really incentivize us to build pieces of technology that are where the user design is centered on an individual's experience rather than a group experience. Um, so I think it's really interesting as well to just kind of notice at that higher level that examples like Lumio and CoBudget are, are kind of like this new species of uh, technologies designed for groups to thrive, not for people, and not for individuals only to sort of gain this vanity experience or, or whatever your example was, Alexa, of, of the sort of uh, the sins of Facebook. <laughs> Beautiful. So I think we have time, just a few minutes left. Um, if there are any questions, maybe one question or two questions, and otherwise we're just going to be around too. So um, as we begin to sort of refine this story and figure out, you know, what works, we're really eager to hear from you guys. What are the types of challenges that you're encountering as you build communities? Um, and maybe lastly, what can we uh, use from cults? Because they've done a lot of this particularly effectively. Uh, and so one of the frameworks that we hacked was this business model canvas for cult creation. 
Um, and so really looking at, for any kind of community design process, how do you think about your origin story and your creation myth? How do you think about the incentives that structure that community? And really just applying a lot of the things that cults do well to think about some of the emergent collaborative economies uh, and new forms of community that we want to structure. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, we'll, we have one question yep. over here. Hi. Uh, is this... Is, oh. Uh, it's working. Hi, uh, my name's Laurie. I um, I live in. I've been living in collectives now for about on and off eight years, and I'm. Uh, I live in a big collective myself in London, which is, uh, among other things, has become a poly collective and a real centre for the queer community in North London. But um, one of the things that we've found is that, uh, and certainly one of the things I've found when I've tried to write about it and think about it is that the politics really emerge from the space rather than vice versa and I'm sure this is something that you experienced with Occupy I certainly did and the space emerged out of necessity we live in a big warehouse one of the reasons we live in a big warehouse is because we can't afford the rent in London otherwise the rent in London is crazy we can only afford to live there because there's sometimes 12 of us and um, out of that, it became easier to shop for food collectively and make meals together collectively, and then everything emerged from there. So I'm wondering what your thoughts were on, rather than starting with the idea or the longing, starting with the space itself and the problems of that when there is so much pressure on space and on housing. Thanks. Fantastic, thank you. Um, do you guys have any reflections on just the power of space in really seeding some of these new communities? I have a really quick anecdote, which is um, I was just in Devon last week um, on a course that really looked at bioregionalism as design and so was focused in this, on this idea of story of place and really being attentive to how the spaces and the geographies that we're in come to inspire the cultures that are there. And so the things that you see um, operating very much within a social or a cultural fabric, you see those mimics within the environment of the space. And you know, specifically in this region of Devon, it was um, notorious for a lot of witch hunts. So the day before we got there, there were a number of indigenous women who had come from around the world to really uh, heal the land and heal some of that trauma. Um, and so it was a powerful experience um, on every level of thinking how place informs the cultures we're trying to build. There was a guy from Silicon Valley who'd recently moved there and was trying to create an incubator. And he was really having to redesign that around that place and specifically, you know, think about how the geography had created a culture that actually wasn't about the sort of lone ranger innovator. I, yeah, I think place is everything. And I also love the way that you brought up uh, in your question uh, the issue of like communities out of necessity rather than communities out of luxury. I yeah. think that's like a really important concept that you've brought through, um, which is kind of, we, we have like dodged around. Um, and I think Derek and I were just living in San Francisco a few months ago, uh, just for a short time to try and understand that world. Uh, and as you say, we were living in, a, in an artist, uh, sort of um, queer activist house filled with many, many bedrooms in the middle of San Francisco. And it's the only way that you can live in the middle of San Francisco at a certain point. Uh, and it's so inspiring to be here in Berlin and in Germany and to know that the work of the, the housing syndicate also as like this incredible example of uh, housing commons practice. Um, and yeah, it's it's from an indigeneity perspective, I think that all culture comes from place because we've always been a land-based species. It's only now in this really strange digital age where we're feeling more disconnect with where do I live, what is my home? Questions like that have been much, much less frequent, I think, in previous generations. And so it becomes more important now also for us to question what we need our roots to be made of, what, like what is rooting, where are you rooting, and what is the culture of that place, and, and how is it coming through you? In New Zealand, we have a practice of you don't introduce yourself by who you are and what you've done. You introduce yourself of your family lineage and where you're from land-wise. You explain which hill you grew up next to, which river, uh, which 
which boat you arrived into New Zealand from, because in Maori culture, everybody arrived on a waka in a canoe from the Pacific Islands hundreds of years ago. And so everyone can trace back to one of these boats. And I think, again, this is a practice of regrounding, recognizing that you are the manifestation of all of these layers of lineage, all of these layers of different connection to land. Uh, and we're inextricably connected with that. So yeah, I just totally honor what you've brought forward, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Alexa Clay. Wonderful. Thank you very much.